Good morning, good afternoon. Hello, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for being here. My name is Carly Lutz, and I am thrilled to be joined here by Darren and Steve for our so our webinar on high performance leadership, strategies to thrive in business and life amid uncertainty. We are thrilled to have this discussion with Steve Millor, uh, who is a former Olympic swim coach turned executive coach uh, for his company, Career Competitor. He also has a thriving podcast uh, that also features our CEO, Damon Lemby. But we are just thrilled to be here um, with Steve, who is going to guide this conversation um, and really talk about how we can all cultivate a winning mindset and turn our aspirations into actionable goals. Um, Darren will be leading and moderating this discussion. Darren uh, is our SVP of product here at Learn It, a renowned communications and leadership training and consultant um, and has been a Bay Area native uh, his entire life. He is an actor, a performer, an artist, um, and we're so lucky to have him um, be a leader and an executive at Learn It and also to foster the discussion here with Steve today um, to ask, ask the tough questions, ask the creative questions. So thrilled to have them both here. Darren and Steve, welcome. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you, Carly. Yeah, thank you, Carly. Thank you so much. I'm just, I'm looking through my questions here thinking, okay, I got to pull out the tough ones. I know. <laughs> like you've really set it up here. It's just like, I know. okay. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, my coffee, my coffee, I should have made my coffee stronger for the tough <laughs> questions. Bring it on, let's go. The, the meaty questions, right? The questions that yeah. matter. Um, yeah. Perfect. Darren, before I turn it over to you, I just want to mm -hmm. say to our audience, this is meant to be super interactive. So please do add your questions in the chat, um, whether you're on YouTube, LinkedIn Live, um, I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll, we'll pause throughout the session and also take time for questions at the end. Um, so please share with us your questions, share with us what city you're tuning in from, where you are in the world. Um, that energizes the conversation, um, knowing that we're talking to a global audience. So um, thank you. I'll turn it over to Darren and Steve and we'll get started. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Carly. Hey, Steve. Hey, brother. How are you? Good. Okay. Looks like it's us now. Yes, just the two of us. Uh, so, uh, so I it was it was great to have the uh, the ability to meet with you and talk with you a little bit before this. Thanks for mm -hmm. taking that time. And I know there's a lot of things we could talk about, but I thought we should really start with your book, Shock the World. Um, mm -hmm. Terrific book with some really um, compelling and surprising ideas that I wanted to get into. Um, and you and you start off with such a great story about. Um, well, what do you mean by shock the world? Mm. And I thought it might be nice if you could just take a bit of time to tell us about the book, you know, basically maybe that story, but also what compelled you to, to write the book. Yeah, no, thanks, Darren. And I think what's crazy is I'm about a month away now from the book being one year old and that that part as well, I think I'm almost ready to start calling myself an author. That takes a lot of time to get used to. Um, <laughs> but uh, But no, it's... It, 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 I love the question and just the way you sort of acknowledge that right away in terms of the world and how I wanted a reader to maybe read this book and not necessarily take the world so literally. Uh, we, if we were all trying to pursue some some way of shocking the entire world, we would all be left, I think, frustrated uh, because the, the world yeah. as a whole is a very big place. Uh, so the yeah. question becomes is what is your world? Like, What is your world when you sit and you think who who are the people that I'm most closest to? Who are the people I have most influence over? What What is it within my career that is realistic? What is maybe yeah. a reach goal within that career? So what does that yeah. world start to look like when you assess all these different components of who you are, how you show up each and every day, and really what your potential influence and impact might look like. And in the case of this book, it was the world of swimming. That's my background is the sport of swimming. And I went on this life altering journey with an athlete from 2019 through the summer of 2021. Uh, his name's Brooks Curry. And he was a completely unrecruited kid uh, into LSU where I was coaching swimming for almost 10 years and brought him in. He was my best kept secret. Uh, and so he was a talented kid, but very rough around the edges. But he told me on that first week that he was on, on campus, coach, I want to be a U.S. Olympian. In fact, I want to be a U.S. Olympian as, as soon as next year, which at the time we didn't know COVID was coming and the 2020 games were supposed to be in 2020. And 
I looked at him across the table. I said, brother, I've heard this. I've heard this statement a hundred times. People have told me a hundred times over. They want to be an Olympian. And I just asked him, do you understand what it takes? And Darren, he didn't ha have the perfect answer, but he had an answer. He had, he thought it through to an extent to where I knew he was serious about it. We could always work on the approach. We could work on that response that he gave me. But yeah. in that response, I knew that he hadn't just come in and just felt the need to tell his coach like, oh, I think today I want to be, I want to be an Olympian. I think I want to be an Olympian. Like he'd really given it some thought. He could tell it was this lifelong ambition. And yeah. so I, I, I heard it. I met him in that space and I said, we're going to set off on this journey together. And um, COVID came, we got an extra year to do it. And, uh, you know, as you, as you learn quite quickly, I, I pretty much share the, the fact that he made the team uh, in the book quite early. In fact, it's probably on the back cover, to be honest. So it's not like I'm giving any spoilers away. But yeah, right. in, in, 20, in 2021, he became a U.S. Olympian, LSU's first ever U.S. Olympian. Um, and we did it in an incredibly unique way that spoke to my unique perspective and approach to coaching in a world that is quite regimented in terms of doing it a very specific way i found very unique ways to go about coaching um and uh yeah that's what the the premise of the book is all about i pull from like 18 different stories from my podcast yeah. in terms of how other people in their respective worlds have realized their world uh, has realized their potential within their protect uh, you know specific world and that's really at the heart of the book with 10 different shocks and all these different insights and exercises that you can do. It, it keeps you busy. It's, it's about a weekend read, but it keeps you busy. I like to think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. You, I, I like the way you pull in a lot of different stories throughout the book. Um, and like, as you reference from your podcast, the career competitor, that's not all just from the swimming world. Um, I do have the sense because you have a little, uh, a bit of Brooks Curry actually talking at the end of the book about how, how in that moment, uh, that dream crystallized into something real. Like I just have the sense for him. It's like kind of just throwing a dream out there, but you took it seriously. And yeah. somehow the two of you like almost gelled in that exact moment to make it um, like a call, like a purpose, like a call to a purpose. Like, okay, if we're going to be serious, this is what it actually is. And that, yeah. that must've been inspiring for him. It, incredibly. And I, I think it, it's so funny when you achieve something like that, once you get there, Everybody within that world of swimming wants to tell you, oh, he's what a talent, what a talent this kid is, what a talent right. this kid is. And, and there's almost this sort of, you know, attitude in that statement of just like, he could have done that anywhere sort of thing. It's just like, that's kind of how it would come across sometimes. It's like, oh, he's so talented. He was going to, he was going to get to this point at some point in his career. Yeah. And to this day, and I know Brooks would speak to this there are hundreds upon thousands of places he could have gone around the United States to try to become a U.S. Olympian. But there was something about that moment and something about our collaboration and partnership through that process that mm -hmm. allowed it to happen the way it did. And I stand by that to this day. I have no doubt that under other coaches, he could be successful. No doubt about that. But considering the circumstances, he had to go pursue that goal under. Yeah. Um, the fact that I was his coach and we were doing it in collaboration and I, to your point, Darren, I met him in that space. The moment he brought it up, he didn't feel an ounce of resistance. He felt nothing but acceptance and encouragement. I think that in itself spoke volumes in terms of just how unique our collaboration and our partnership was through those two years towards that goal. When you, when you read it, I have this sense for myself and I, and I imagine others might have this sense or at least relate to it of that feeling like you have this potential and you want somebody to see it. Mm -hmm. And, and in a sense, I almost have the, this idea that your, your book is trying to help you do that for yourself. Like, oh, I wish I had a coach like Steve Miller to show up and see that potential and help me realize it. So the book is like, well, how can I help you do that for yourself is essentially the path. I'm it, it fills my heart that that came across because it's, that is exactly why I wrote the book. And as I've built my business in the last two years, the one thing I say to every audience specifically that I speak to is like, I realize my, my potential by helping you realize yours. That is, I, I make it that simple when I start talking. I was like, there is no, there's literally nothing on this planet outside of my children and what they achieve and what they do each and every day. There is nothing on this planet that fills my cup more than watching another person not only recognize the potential they have, but then go and pursue it. And if you don't get it through the first chapter of the book, my hope is that the more you keep reading the book, the more you're just going to sort of see my message coming through. Just like yeah. 
now do it now do it now stop waiting yeah. stop waiting do yeah. it now yeah, and, yeah. And, and, yeah. and so like again yeah. i i try to be friendly and gentle about that push but i like to think towards the end of the book i'm just like if you're still reading at this point how yeah. have you not figured this out yet your potential's worth pursuing go do it go do it yeah 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 that's great yeah. well there is there's a lot of sense of urgency in the book that definitely uh comes through but the other thing too is that it's very practical like I could have that feeling and want to be my own coach, but the question is how, you know, I mean, I used to teach tennis a lot and it's, it's easy to say, well, here's what you need to do. But for a lot of, yeah, but how, how do I do that? How do I get the racket below and coming up above? Cause I seem to be getting it wrong. Um, and the book has some real practical hows. And I want to start with one that was surprising to me, but there's kind of a build up to it. So early in the book, you talk about this moment that was really like this uh, surprisingly low moment for you. You say you had, it was the summer of 2012, you'd been seven years in the U.S., you had your master's degree, you just started your full-time job at LSU as a swim coach, and um, as you said, you were, you felt like you were on the cusp of good things. You said that uh, athletes had bought into you and they were, you were looking at the beginning of a long, successful career. And right at that moment, your visa was denied and you had to leave. There's like nothing you could do. You had to go back to the UK. So this kind of built into a question I have, but can you first just let us like talk us through that moment for you? Yeah. And I, I'm kind of, I'm very, uh, my, my British humor comes out as I'm writing the book in that point as well, that I, I joke about as I reflected in that moment. And I had people in January and February of 2012 telling me like, Hey, in, in four or five weeks, you should be good. And then three months would go by and I wouldn't hear from them. And I, and I kept acting as though everything was going to work out. And it's like, well, dude, yeah. you should have, you should have started putting some of these pieces together a little sooner than you did. And I'll yeah. just put that down to naivety of age. But you know, at the, at the heart of that was that in the space of two weeks from that information being provided to me that, Hey, you need to, start planning for your future away from not only LSU out of this country. Like we, you didn't get the visa. You didn't get the visa. Like, so this, this is now the reality of the situation. So in the space of two weeks, I went from that information and I remember it to this day because I can, I can literally close my eyes and put myself back in that moment, being on my then boss's apart, um, uh, driveway at his house with my entire apartment on his driveway, trying to sell it. Because <laughs> I, I was one year into a career. I didn't have a lifetime of savings. I was one year into a career. I didn't have this 10, 15 years of experience to fall back on. I didn't have this network to fall. I had literally, I went from having some sort of vision and idea for my future to being completely cut and to then saying like, whatever, whatever I can make of these minimal resources I have in my world, I need to do that right now because I'm about to get on a plane and be gone. As far as in my mind, I'm gone for good you know and so you know that reality of that situation more than anything the message that i get across is this notion of how well do you know yourself because life is going to hand you these moments where you are forced to be with you and only you yeah. and i would i would never want someone to be in a situation where they are forced to only have themselves as company Mm -hmm. themselves as an option before they start doing that work on who they are what they want how they relate to themselves etc cetera, etc cetera. so for me i was forced yeah. into that moment at the age of 26 27 to sit with myself to spend countless hours with my thoughts with myself knowing that i've never spent any time getting to know who the heck this person is uh -huh. and as i as i say it in this book the more i spent time with that guy i didn't like him i didn't like that guy <laughs> You know, I didn't like yeah. it, you know, yeah. and that's, that's a tough realization to hit, right? That's a tough realization yeah. to have with yourself. But until I was forced to stop and slow down and actually yeah. spend that time with myself, I was able yeah. to finally come to that realization that I had a lot of work to do on me. Yeah. Well, this is what I thought was so interesting in that moment is you, a lot of people in that situation are going to either externalize or internalize like externalize that the world is against me, all these horrible things or internalize, like, what did I do? It's my fault. Um, or, you know, some combination of both. But what you described was not liking, not, not like even actually kind of hating the person you were outside of being that swim coach in the United States. I think you're in recruitment. It wasn't a knock against recruitment. It was just, that you didn't love the person in that world. You didn't love you in that world. And I've heard people talk a lot about you got to love what you do, but I've never really heard somebody talk about you have to love you in what you love to do. Mm -hmm. 
And yes. that's a really fascinating idea to me. And I just wondered if you could share a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, when I think of why we're here and what we're talking about, this sort of notion of high performance leadership and how to thrive within your business, like at some point as a leader and as a business, you're going to get tested. You're going to get tested in some way, shape or form. And in those moments of adversity, chances are you're going to have to fall back on who you are. <laughs> who you really are so mm -hmm. maybe you've been putting on a front without realizing it for all this time but because things have been successful because things are moving in a good direction you don't see any reason to press pause and do some self-reflection and, and do some work on you yeah. and then suddenly adversity hits and now you're being forced to really lean on who am i at my core and yeah. who, how do i intend to respond in this moment and like i said that moment of adversity came for me at a young enough age for me to do something about it but then when I start to think about, okay, loving who you are, at the end of the day, when you prioritize loving yourself, the likelihood of you then ending up doing what it is you love is exponentially increased. Because a lot of the time we assume, hey, once I find that thing that I love, I will be happy. Yeah. But truth yeah. be told is if we can find that fulfillment and happiness internally first, you will you will take so much pride in that work that you will only allow yourself to do things that fill that cup that reinforce that version of you yeah, that you've spent yeah. so much time creating you yeah. know and and that's what i love about this notion of sure go do what you love you you should be doing that 100% but imagine how easy that thing would be to find if you did the work on you first to know yeah. hey i love what i i love who i am therefore if i'm doing something that i love I'm going to know. I'm going to know. Yeah. yeah. I, it's re it's a really interesting idea. And I, and I appreciate you. you bring, I don't, I mean, again, I just can't think where I've actually heard this before, but um, finding that version of yourself that you, that you like, that you love, that that's who I, that's who I like when I show up and letting that help guide where you want to be in life because they do go together. I and mean, there's a lot of research that, that suggests that people, well, you talk about community and we'll talk about that in a little bit too, but like mm -hmm. the people you surround yourself and the environment that you put yourself in has a big effect. We're not completely, you know, independent and autonomous that we can kind of manifest this perfect reality every moment of your life. You can certainly put yourself in a situation that encourages and brings out the best in you. And mm -hmm. to kind of start with that idea and even knowing, you know, what what do I love about myself? I think it's um, it's powerful though. Yeah. So, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. it. And it also makes me think of something else here too, because we're really talking about the world of business. And you you use the word love pretty liberally in this book. And love is sort of a funny word to use in a business setting. I one right. time I can remember a client coming to me uh, with their team and saying, you know, what what are your goals? And so, well, I want to bring more love into the team. It's like, okay, that's very unusual. I never hear people say that, but um, you're coaching in the business world with a lot of executives right now. I guess this, you know, love, but also just emotions. What what role do like emotions and something like love play in the business world where people have a tendency to want to tamp them down? Yeah, well, the hot topic in leadership, you know, here we are talking about leadership today. The, the, the biggest sought after trait right now is is emotional intelligence like you know and, and they, we talk about this thing as you know almost as though some organizations are identifying their leaders are lacking it and they want to throw them into a an eq training and it's just like well it's it's not something you just open up a book and you go this is how i become more emotionally intelligent you know there's there, there has to be this true intentionality behind it of just like i want to better relate i want to better understand you know it, it starts again with that inner reflection of just like if I'm not relating to people effectively, what work do I need to do on myself first before I maybe start reading some of these things I need to have a heightened awareness to in other people, you know? Yeah. And, and so that for me, every single executive business owner leader that I work with now that I've had the pleasure to work with in the last two years, until they can answer confidently from a position of self, I always yeah. encourage them to wait before they start to, act on in any other capacity so again if, if if they're frustrated in a relationship let's say with somebody within their team so and so is not communicating so and so is this so and so is that okay stop look internally ask yourself first is there anything you could have done better or anything you could continue to invest in right now as yourself first and foremost 
to bridge whatever this issue is. And if you feel great about your answer to that and your response and your work towards that, then now's a good time to show up in this space and maybe do something about it externally. So for me, I think that ability to just sort of press pause, stop, always ask ourselves as executives, as leaders, as high potential performers, whatever it is, what am I doing? What can I do firstly myself? How can I take ownership for this myself? How can I work on my emotions myself? before I then try to show up and influence any of those things towards other people. It's a great, it's great insight. And just that ability to bring, um, I mean, I, I often feel like, cause we do uh, EQ training, people want to kind of work on this thing, this a lot, but a lot of times it feels like it's just about like, how do we like limit and control it instead of recognizing like your emotions are super valuable. Um, you, it's, it's, it's getting the value out of them, not just trying to sort of manage them and put them in a box, which means that you still can work with them in a, in a um, self-control way, but getting that value and self-awareness. And we've talked now a bit about the self and, 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 that leads me to one of the big topics in your book, which is the optimal self. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you said it earlier too, that gap between potential and execution and how frustrating it is for you to see potential wasted. Um, a lot of your focus is on this being that optimal self. Um, maybe just a few, you know, if you could say a little bit more about the optimal self. Yeah, and I, I'd have to... I'd have to go back and check my wording because, again, I, I could have easily used a term like being your optimal self while I was writing the book. But the one thing I'm very cognizant about now when I show up and speak to people is I talk about pursuing your optimal self. Oh, I'm, nice. very, I'm very cognizant of this notion of the pursuit of the optimal self versus being your optimal self because the more and more I've worked in this space, I continue to work hard on helping people see, as, and it can sometimes be a deflating insight, you may never become your optimal self, yeah. ever. You yeah. may never realize your absolute full potential, ever. But the pursuit, yeah. the pursuit of that is where the growth is. And again, people hear these very vague terms like trust the process and things like that over the years. And you, you kind of, you say yes to it, but you don't really know what it means. You just go, okay, yeah, I'll trust the process. I'll trust the process. I'll be patient. I'll be patient. But again, what are you trusting? What are you being patient towards? And again, when you pursue the optimal self, and when I speak to large groups, I talk about the optimal self as the North Star, because the beauty of that North Star is it, it's this thing in the sky. It's this thing in the distance that no man or woman alive will ever get to, but it can be this incredible source of direction for any man or woman alive. Incredible yeah. source of direction. It can show you where to go. It can help you see when it's dark, right? It, like, it's the most powerful metaphor that I can use towards the optimal self because for me, each and every day, the way I check in with myself, it's my kind of like pass fail on the day. Keep it really yeah. simple. Yeah. Did I or did I not pursue my optimal self today? And there's days where I don't. There's days where I'm just beat. I've got a four-year-old and a three-year-old at home. <laughs> I got a wife that yeah. works too. Yeah. You know, we got a lot going on. We travel a lot. We're a busy, busy, yeah. we're a busy team. I call us a team. We're a family, but we're a team. And, and, yeah. and, you know, that busyness sometimes, I'm not really in the mood to pursue my optimal self once or twice every, let's say, three or four months. Like I'm, I'm pretty beat. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, at the same time, when you can have that pass fail mindset and keep it that yeah. simple each and every day, do I, can I, can I check that box? Can I say pass today? on whether yeah. or not I was pursuing my optimal self, because I think we're very good at gauging our own pass fail systems when we're really checking in and being honest with ourselves. And I, I, I find it to be the most productive way for me of assessing a successful day, because sometimes it's very hard to make those metrics. So pass fail, did I pursue my optimal self? Yes, no. And if it's, if it's a lot more yes than no, then you're on the right path. Yeah. When you make time, you actually intentionally do that every day, don't you? Yeah. Yep. And it, it is, it, it, it is a, it is a, a habit of sitting down and it is we're talking 30 seconds we're talking sitting in bed at night when the world has calmed down when your world has slowed down when things are quiet and you can find that headspace where you can have an honest insightful sort of thought and yeah. stop and say in a reflection pass fail for today yes or no you know yeah. And, yeah. and and really find a way to answer that honestly and and if you are saying yes pushing yourself even one step further and saying how am I doing it? What are those things I consistently do, those deposits I consistently make 
in pursuit yeah. of my optimal self because those are the tangible components that you can start to hang your hat on and make yeah. you know true resources in that pursuit i think we all have kind of an intuitive sense of what the optimal self means but do you have any uh like tips for people on like well what is, how do you find that goal what is your optimal self yeah, I actually love that question because it, it, it's it's an exercise that I now do with some of my some of my clients. Is that you know we talk about optimal self and they start to build a feeling of what that might look like over the first say quarter of working together, and then I use this analogy of a of a tripod. So I just I, we we call it the tripod exercise, and I say, okay, mm -hmm. you show up in a room and you're surrounded by a whole bunch of people that know you as well as anybody on this planet. If yeah. they were to say, what are the three legs of your tripod that if you were to not have one of them, something about you would be off. And I, and I use the tripod analogy purposely because when one of those legs goes down, the whole thing goes down. What, mm -hmm. are gonna, what will be those three legs to yourself mm -hmm. that represent you at your absolute fullest when people know, hey, Steve walked into the room and when Steve walks into the room, bang, bang, bang. These are the three things I know I'm always gonna get. And for me, it's health, it's my mm -hmm. faith and it's my investment in knowledge. Those three things, like people always yeah. can sort of rely on me to bring that energy into a room. And that's how I'm identified when I, if, if I'm pursuing my best self in those three areas, then I get to show up with the energy that hopefully I'm bringing to this podcast that I'm bringing to a, a keynote speak, speech that I have in three hours from now. Like I know I can show up with my optimal self when I'm invested fully daily in those three parts of my tripod. So anyone listen to this, I, I challenge you, like find those three legs. What are those three legs for you where you know when you're at your best, it's because you're investing consistently in these three phases of your life that's allowing you to show up as your optimal self. That's great. I love that it's only three because it's manageable and it sort of forces you to really exactly exactly and, and again trust me when I started this I'm like optimal self I'm like bang 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 I'm like there's like 23 things that make up my optimal self I'm like well that's that's not that's not realistic Steve like that yeah. and, and again it's also kind of BS in the sense of if one or two of those were to go down you'd still find a way it's why I love the tripod analogies it forces you to get so clear on what are what are going to be these three things that if yeah. one of them were to go down, I would in instinctively know something's off. Something's yeah. off and one, I'm yeah. not pouring into one of those three things. And I need to figure out what it is. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's really good. And again, it goes back to this idea of pursuit of optimal self because you're giving yourself time to figure out what those three things are. Like, right. like kind of dial it in and then keep. Um, oh, and those things change from one chapter of life to the next too. Trust yeah. me, those... Those yeah. three legs are a lot different today than they were maybe five years ago from me. And that's, that's yeah. the other part of it too. When are you ready to say, okay, this leg's not really serving me anymore. Or it's not as essential for me to consider anymore. What do I need to substitute it with? Yeah. Uh, well, something that we, uh, we teach here, uh, just a whole class just dedicated on listening because it's, it's such an important skill, but to really listen takes energy. I mean, it, it always does. And sadly, the person that you often, don't listen to the best. This is this closeness communication bias is that, you know, the, the person is closest to you. You get home at the end of the day with your partner and like, that's the person you're not listening to because you spend so much effort all day long listening. And I'd like to let people know that it's okay to find times you don't have the pressure to listen at that level. Like, you know, how do you do that? Do you do that a little bit with optimal self to you? give yourself a break sometimes? <laughs> It, would it be funny if I said, can you repeat the question right now? <laughs> no. um, I, just felt, I, I felt that would be a really good joke. Sorry, I'm going to let it go. It's like, that's my dad humor oh, yeah. kicking in. My dad humor yeah. kicking in. Um, no, you know, for me, I, I love that because it, it, it's so important to understand that I know I just asked that question. You shouldn't have an answer to that question by the end of today. You know, it, it, you, you shouldn't. You know, it, it should be a trial and error approach it should be that ability to press stop i even put something on social media i think in the past week it was just like again to your point darren like listening is in my and, and i i agree like listening is without a doubt the most important communication skill and yeah. it's the most underrated and most disregarded one sadly um yeah. and we're always trying to figure out how to better listen yeah. how good are you at listening to yourself yeah, yeah like how good yeah. are you how good are you at listening to yourself Honestly, yeah. like, be honest about that. How often do you ignore what your intuition is telling you? You yeah. know, yeah. And, and, and we 
and I'm not going to sit here and say I'm perfect at it. And I'm, I'm sure you're not like we're okay. every single night. I, I again, four year old, three year old, they like, what do they like for dinner? Chicken nuggets, fries. Like, <laughs> they don't want yeah. my salmon and rice. Yeah, yeah. But does dad grab a bite of their fries and grab a little bit of their chicken nugget? He absolutely does. Especially if they <laughs> leave it on their plate. My yeah. intuition in that moment is saying, Steve, you're committed to a much healthier lifestyle than these chicken nuggets and fries are serving you. But I yeah. choose to not listen to myself in that moment. We do that in all areas of life. Now, if it's a chicken nugget here and a fry there, it's not having a huge impact. Yeah. But when yeah. we think about the message of my book, when we think about why we're here today, if you're trying to be a high performance leader, but everything about your intuition continues like to tell you this is what I should do and you refuse to listen. Yeah then whose fault is it that you're not a high performing leader? And that's yeah. a tough, that's a tough question to have to answer and a tough sort of reality to have to admit. Yeah. But again, like when you can start to listen to you better, yeah. imagine how much better you're going to get at listening to others. Cause you're going to empathize more because you relate, right? Empathy is going to become this easy thing for you because you're really good at listening to yourself. You're going to start to see these opportunities to relate in other people, to know what someone else is going through. And that's just example yeah. one of what it can do. It, it's an endless benefit. Yeah. You, in a section in your book, you also spend time talking about the truth. Yeah. You give examples of working with maybe a group of salespeople who kind of have, well, this happened, this happened, this happened. But what's missing there is sort of this truth idea. Um, so I'm just thinking about when you're listening to yourself, how do you recognize the truth? I feel like it's easy for people to maybe get it wrong sometimes. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, this is a pro this is, can also be a process. What is the truth here? Right. Yeah. And uh, the reason I wrote that chapter, it came, I think I even, I think this is the introduction I wrote in the chapter too, is this when I was working with college athletes, they would finish their race and they would come to me and they'd just be like, Oh, that sucked. That was terrible. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was never, it was always either incredible or terrible. And it was this giant spectrum of just, we just ignored and avoided. And I would always say, okay, where can we find some reality in this situation? Like, what yeah. is going on here? Is it, yeah. was it terrible? Was there anything that was good about it? Well, you yeah. know, I did this well, I did this well. Okay. So maybe we're moving out of the terrible mindset. Now we're moving more into the okay mindset, the decent yeah. mindset, like whatever it might be, but we're using the truth to actually pull us out of this exaggeratory mindset that we've moved into. And mm -hmm. I, that's, that's where I always tell people to start with this. If you're thinking and operating with absolutes, yeah, if it's yeah. always, this feels terrible. This feels phenomenal. I'm here to tell you that there is about 57 other emotions on that spectrum that you're not yeah. considering, you know, yeah. Like, yeah. And, and if you can just start to say, okay, let's, let's just, let's just assume it wasn't terrible. Let's just assume yeah. it wasn't phenomenal because it's important to go both ways. Yeah. When it's phenomenal, how can you be truthful with yourself to say, well, if there were to be something that I could have done better, what would that one thing be? And yeah. find some truth in that. And maybe you try to pull that phenomenal down from phenomenal to it was incredible, but it still has, it still has, there's still something there to work on. And that little bit of truth can be so serving in your growth. Same yeah. goes with the terrible, the terrible mindset it can paralyze people. Sometimes it can force people to stop. Like if you remain in that absolute mindset and you're unable to pull some of the truths of growth of, of, of good from yeah. those terrible moments, if you can start doing that, then you can at least maintain some momentum, even in the face of a disappointing result. Yeah. Right. So again, yeah. it's how can you get a little bit more in the reality of the situation? And I love asking this question to, to my clients, like, Okay, I hear everything you're saying, but what is going on here? Like, yeah, tell me yeah. what's really going on here. Yeah. And then they stop and they think and they listen. And 20 seconds later, we get a much more true yeah. uh, example yeah. of what is going on. Yeah. There's a, an interesting connection here that brings us back to this EQ idea because when you hear the word truth, you think, you know, facts, cognitive, just very logical. But in a sense, um, what's missing is, is emotional granularity. We tend to just jump right away to like something was horrible or something was amazing, but there's so much more richness to, to our emotional lives, but we don't, 
sort of pay enough attention, you need to see all that, those granulations. This is the Brene Brown stuff too, that and all the different kinds of emotions um, in order to really understand the, emo the, uh, the truth of something as well, which is a yeah. nice connection. And it's, what I, it's also what I love about what like you were talking about love before and how that could be a really yeah. icky word to use in the workplace. Yeah. It's like, yeah. what if we were to find a way to put love on a spectrum where, yeah. you know, you yeah. could say like, yeah, I'm, I'm we're not, we're not saying that you're in love, yeah, right? Yeah, we're saying yeah. that you simply love, like you, yeah. you love it. Like what, what, how would you, if you were to pick three, five, seven words that describe the way in which you feel yeah. when you love doing something, yeah. then let's pick one of those words instead. Like whatever that word may be that you relate to. Yeah. I, I did a, a workshop with a construction company and the CEO is just like, if you go in there using the word love with a bunch of construction guys, yeah. they're going to, they're going to get real uncomfortable and real quiet. Real quick. <laughs> And I said, well, I said, well, one, I said, trust me, one, two, I was like, let me help them redefine what that word can mean in the workplace, Yeah. in yeah. the workplace. Yeah. And, and, and I was able to do that. And, and you suddenly get guys coming out of their shells now that typically yeah. a word like that would have them run away, you know? Yeah. So it's, yeah. it, it, again, I, I love that, that notion of what you're saying, that sort of Brene Brown insight. It's yeah. It's we need some of those like Danish words, you know, uh, uh, for like, like seven different versions of like right, what love right. means in a business setting, not romantic love. Yep. Uh, so we, we, um, I want to go back a little bit more into this, uh, um, where you, where you start with, uh, being a coach in a sports landscape, you talk about collaborative competition. And we tend to think of collaboration as one thing, competition as another thing. And you actually talk about competitive collaboration, bringing these to compete. That's how you say it, bringing both of these things together. And I think that's kind of a fascinating idea on a team or in a workplace where you um, like, how do you balance both of those things effectively in a work setting? Yeah. And um, it's funny that this whole term competitive collaboration was born out of my writing of the community chapter as I was writing community and this notion of competitive collaboration came out and I touched on it within that chapter. And it's, be it's actually become this whole thing in itself. Now within my business, I did a speech on specifically competitive collaboration at the, uh, at the annual uh, society for human resource management conference in Vegas earlier this year. And the, at the heart of it, what I'm saying is that when we approach collaboration, a lot of the time, we don't know what our role is. We're, we're being encouraged to work together, but we're, there, there's too much of a disconnect between that opportunity to be around others, working with others, and mm -hmm. really knowing what our role and responsibility is. So when we actually focus on the competitive component of ourself, the individual first, we can uh -huh. then approach collaboration with greater accountability. So my point by that is that I believe what makes everyone competitive, and I ask rooms all the time, like, who here's a competitor? And never all the hands go up. And I enjoy that challenge of like, I'm going to convince you by the end that you are, in fact, competitive. Because for me, competitiveness means knowing what's in it for me. Like, before I commit, what's in it for me? And if someone is committing to something where they see there's something in it for them, then they are being competitively minded. They have, they've decided that, hey, I'm putting into this what I want to get out. That's competition. It may be individual, it may be private, but yeah. it's still competition. And when you start to approach yourself that way within a team environment, you can then approach collaboration with that same discussion. Hey, you and I, or three or four of us, we're coming into this collaborative space. And by coming into this collaborative space, we're all making a commitment firstly to ourselves that we know what's, what we're putting into this because we, we know what we want to get out of it. And now we can hold one another accountable to that very same sentiment. If I'm doing that to the, my best of my ability, then I can hold others accountable. But chances are, you're always going to be held more accountable to putting into this what you intend to get out when yeah. other people are as invested in seeing you do that. You know, yeah. and, that, and that's where that's where the beauty of competitive collaboration comes. Is you know, I speak to curiosity, growth mindset. And accountability those are the three parts for me that I've, I've, I've made part of competitive collaboration because when we're curious about how we can grow the only thing we have to then do is hold that very line of thought accountable and that's kind of how it all works together be curious have a growth mindset and then remain accountable to that curiosity so the cycle never ends and if we're doing that as an individual and then we're bringing that into collaboration we're going to know that in that collaboration no one's hiding no one's getting out of work 
No one's yeah. going to be that guy from college who, hey, don't forget me to put my name on the paper. You know, I was in the group too, guys. Remember, you know, yeah, like yeah. we all had that person that we worked with. Maybe <laughs> yeah. there may have been times where I was that guy, but the the the, the fact of the matter is that like, that is what you avoid now with competitive collaboration. Everyone's bringing their fullest self to the collaboration, and they're holding everybody accountable within that collaboration to doing the same. Well, I, that's interesting because I think that's that's a lot where this came from, right? You talk about on the, this 27 days of helping to get uh, Brooks to the, to the level that he needed. And it, it reminded me of the Tour de France. Where we've got a whole team of writers mm -hmm. all working to support one person who's going to stand on the yeah. podium. But they're all competitively working to collaborate towards that. In a business setting, that could be a little tougher for people because they might feel like, oh, you know, it's human nature to want to tell a single person's story. Mm. So the whole team might work on something, but people, human beings are going to look for the story of the person that made the success and stuff. And sometimes I think that can be hard for people to, uh, in, in terms of recognition. Yeah. And, and again, think again, this, this conversation, being a leader and then taking that form of leadership, that high performance mindset leadership into the business space to help thrive within business. Like, Again, it starts with the self. Again, it starts with that. Listen, if what does it mean for me to hold myself accountable to a growth mindset and remain curious at all times towards that? Yeah. If I'm all in on that, then I can start to recruit the team, recruit the people necessary that I know us are, are, are all capable of doing the same thing. And now we're operating in a space yeah. with the same culture. And that's really what is the heart. We're talking about culture here, you know, and, and again, when you create that from the outset, you get that buy-in. And then yeah. the only job from that point on is to maintain this cycle so that the engagement in it continues to rise more and more and more and more. And that's, yeah. for me, I think we always struggle with culture and how do we make it tangible or how do we make it measurable? For me, yeah. this is kind of my approach to doing exactly that. Yeah, then it becomes so much about the pursuit because you, you you have that sense of like being a band, you know, that's that's, that's where it. it's working and you're all that's moving it. towards something. Yeah. Community is another big, and you brought it up earlier, to, it's, it's something that you, you have kind of an interesting take on too. You talk about, I mean, I imagine the community that's there for professional athletes, especially when they're successful and they have a, a physio and a trainer and a dietitian and a coach and like all these people. But you talk about building your own community um, and almost like people in your community don't even know they're part of your community. Mm -hmm. Like you kind of almost create the same thing, but just for yourself. Uh, right. So going back to developing yourself, your optimal self, how do you go about building a community uh, almost like a, like a famous professional athlete would have? Yeah. Uh, and, and again, like there's, this is where the competitive collaboration concept really started to kind of become its own thing is that for me, I was only able to really relate to my own story in this regard. And then the more I started to write it out and check in with other people, I found a lot of similarity in other people's stories too, is that when I started my business, I knew how to coach. I did yeah. not know how to build a business. And yeah. so for me, yeah. for me, that awareness, truth, that awareness was important from the very beginning. So the question was, how do I surround myself with people that are going to be as equally uh, interested and motivated and charged as I am about building my business? And how do I show them that any and every insight that they're providing me is being applied, is being held accountable? And yeah. that there is some sort of fruit to that labor. When I when I go away and apply it, I'm coming away and telling them not only did I do it, but this was the result. This was the progress. And and suddenly now that person feels pretty incentivized to pour back into me because yeah. you know I'm holding myself accountable to that relationship. And what I had at the beginning was about three or four folks that, as you joke there, is like it's true. I say in the story, like I had a community of people that didn't even know they were in my community. Yeah. You know, and, and the reason was, is that they all serve different roles at different times, but it was never for me just to benefit. It was for me to recognize that if I'm asking this of them, yeah. then I better give them even more in return. That is what's yeah. so important in a community is that if we're yeah. in a community of take, 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 good luck keeping that community. When, yeah. when, when that community is take and give and take and give and it's just always like you give me this i'm going to give you this you give me this i'm going to get like more and more like always raising the bar every single time and so for yeah. me every time i would go back and i would tell them what i'd applied they would yeah. get excited for me yeah. and part of part of my return to them was them seeing that their insights their advice was being put to great use people appreciate that 
Yeah, you know, yeah, people appreciate yeah. that. I can't yeah. tell you how much advice I've given in the last year now that people have seen that I'm established. That three yeah. months go by, and I'm like, I don't see any return on that advice that I gave that person. Like, they came yeah. and they got it, they didn't apply it clearly, and yeah. I've not heard from them since. You know, again, like that doesn't yeah. make me want to be in their community. Yeah, you know? and like that, that's the accountability part of community that I think we sometimes get wrong is we assume people should just want to gather around and be a part of a community. Yeah. What are you putting into this community for them to feel as though it's worth yeah. them being a part? Yeah, yeah. I, it's, um, it seems super important to build that community, uh, especially, you know, you're not like paying them. And to be clear, what you've got here is, um, I mean, there's your social social community, which is your family and friends. Sure. There's networking, which is often, you know, the kind of thing we're doing on LinkedIn. You're talking about something kind of a slightly different in between, which is to purposefully build that community that can help you achieve your goals and be your optimal self and, um, and kind of create that team. Cause you know, it sort of takes like a village and, um, yeah. again, really practical advice about how you can actually do that and make it worthwhile for them to be a part of this community for you to help you achieve what you want to achieve. And certainly you need to do that if you're an entrepreneur and you're starting a business, but honestly, I think anybody needs to do that anywhere in their life. Once they establish that, that optimal self they want to go for. Yeah. And I'm, and I encourage clients all the time. Sometimes, the work that we do is very business oriented and occasionally it'll just flutter in something very personal. Like I want to lose 10 pounds. I want to start yeah, working out yeah. more or whatever it is. And I go, well, what's your community look like to do that? It's like, well, I'm yeah. a part of a gym. I was like, okay, name me three people at that gym. Yeah. And they, they, yeah. they can't, you know, like they just go in, they do their thing and they leave. And it's like, well, what does that community look like for you in terms of people that will really want to pour into you because you, they see you pouring into yourself in, this objective that you have of losing 10 pounds or whatever it is like creating those communities is so important but i want to tie this back just real quick to yeah. where we started here too like this notion of getting to know yourself mm -hmm. like the more you know yourself the more you're going to know what you need from your community yeah yeah it's so important again it's just like and then you also know what you can bring to this community that you've created. And before long, others are going to want you to be in their community. That's, it's yeah. not like it's your community with big gates that nobody else can come in and go out of. The yeah. beauty of these communities is that it serves this particular part of your pursuit of your optimal self. And then yeah. you can go join some, someone else's community and be an advocate for that very same thing. Like it, it's, yeah. it's wonderfully yeah. reciprocal in that regard. So it's just like, for me, it just allows you to sort of double down on once you get clear on knowing who you are, you start yeah. to know what it is you need around you to fulfill yeah. that version of yourself. Yeah, that's great. One, um, one, one other question I really wanted to get to because I, I, I thought it was um, important. But you talk about effort and intention, and I, I think intention sometimes gets disregarded people just yeah. they just do effort especially in a business setting and you know, just throw hours at it let's put an effort to it but in that athletic sense effort without intention doesn't get you very far it's like the deliberate practice kind of thing so can you talk about in the importance of intention um, mm -hmm. especially in a kind of a leadership workplace setting yeah and i have to always re like reframe it a little bit with especially with clients it's just like you know they've heard it for their entire entirety of their life like um, intention without action means nothing. It's just, it's just intent. It's like, okay, get it. 100% totally agree. Yeah. There's tons of uh, examples of why that is, but what if we considered intentional action? Like, so yeah. there's intention, there's action, and then there's intentional action. And, you know, for me, that is where so many of these accountability structures that we've talked about already are so important. That's why this notion of knowing who you are, what it is you need around you is so important because, yeah. Then when you start to really identify with these intentions that mean something more than ever before, the question then becomes is what does action look like fueled by these intentions? Again, yeah. like the, 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 once you get clear on all that work beforehand, the intention becomes this powering force for you to take action in a certain way. And I have to always sort of sit, you know, almost fighting on behalf of intention sometimes when people tell me like, Oh, I've, I've, I've heard a bunch of intentions over the years and seen no action. And I go, well, it's because the intention needed more work, not because the action needed more work. The, the, yeah. the problem was that they, they didn't do enough work on the intention. If they'd gotten a greater why behind the intention, if they'd gotten a greater sort of outlook on what this intention can do for them, guarantee you the actions are going to come. Guarantee you. 
But if you make it just about the fact that they didn't act and you focus on, hey, they didn't follow through, it's the wrong thing to be to be focusing on, in my opinion. It, the, 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 the importance at that point is to go back a step and say, what did we miss within the, the creation of the intention to fuel yeah. the likelihood of action? This, that, yeah. that's, that's the missing piece for me. It's especially good for leaders, right? Because I think for leaders, it's pretty easy to feel like, okay, great. Here's your intention. Go. Let's look at action. But it's like, well, maybe the intention needs more work and maybe we need to keep pursuing getting the intention right uh, in order to uh, stay on track. Yeah. And again, the, the intention of uh, your intentions versus somebody else's intentions. Yeah. Again, that can be a, a immediate red flag too. It's just like, yeah. Did you guys have the same intentions? Because you both you both speaking you both speaking very differently yeah. here, and no yeah. wonder yeah. the actions weren't what we expected them to be. Because it turns out we didn't actually get clear on what our intentions were in the first. Yeah, place. yeah. Steve, I have a bunch of questions I didn't get to here, and I could do this keep going, but I, I know we are getting uh, pretty close to time. We should just check in and see if maybe there are some some questions out there that other folks had that we should should try to introduce. Carly. Um, how are we looking when it comes to, uh, I don't know, just any questions that other folks might have had? Yeah, thank you so much. I am like vigorously taking in like everything the two of you are saying and talking about. So super insightful conversation. Thank you both. Uh, we had a lot of engagement and uh, a lot of receptiveness to really everything. One of the things that folks have no specific questions, but that people have been like gravitating towards is that idea of the collaborative competitiveness mm. um, and kind of that being a central point. So I don't know if we want to expand maybe a little bit more of that, but that seems to be a sticking point for a lot of people in the chat just around, I think the word community being thrown around so much right and how do you build community how do you how do you enter community you know right i think i think about this so much in my life and my work too um and it can feel like such a filler word so that was a big aha moment for me with with you all talking about about that and 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 that collaborative competitiveness so um just selfishly is there anything else we can kind of pull out any other insights from that that like like kind of working towards building that that we can leave the audience with um because that seems to be something that resonated with a lot of people. Well, what, I think, Steve, what might be helpful is actually a couple of specific recommendations around building a community. As I recall, you had a list in there of like things that you looked for specifically when you were building your community around starting your new business. Like, right. uh, It's not just random. It's like, oh, right. I like that person. Let's make them part of my community. Right, right. And, and, and I, I appreciate you kind of leading me into that, Darren, because yeah. that is – the same way, the same way you do the work on your optimal self and you create that tripod and you, you take the time and you be patient about it and you be explorative about it and you be willing to trial and error about it. Um, that's a great place to start with yourself, even your mindset to a certain extent. But then when we take it one step further, and we're, in, we're inviting influence into our life, which is what our community is supposed to be. Yeah. You need to double down on that very process yet again, because that's going to be the first true test of the work that you did on yourself because now you've got influence right yeah. and now people are going to start telling you all this work that you did on yourself maybe one or two people might turn around and say i wouldn't look at it that way i would maybe look at it this way and suddenly now you're going to be challenged do you want to receive that information or yeah. do you want to push that information away so yeah. getting clear on exactly what it is you need around you before right. you get clear on who it is you need around you start yeah. with the what then move yeah. to the who, because it's really easy just to go, oh, that person's successful. Yeah, I should have that person influencing me. But yeah. what if they're going to bring things into that community that you really don't need? Maybe you've got a lot of that stuff figured out. Yeah, But yeah. there's these one or two gaps within your process, gaps within your armor that you need to really focus on finding those who's that can fulfill those what's that you need to be actually focused on. Yeah, right. So in your case, certainly people that supported your tripod is you wanted to get into this business. So I'm looking for somebody who's who's done this, who's been around, but like they get not they they approach knowledge in a way that I resonate with. It's it's real. Um, but then also for you, it's recognizing probably where where you're weak. What weaknesses do I have that I you know that I could benefit from? Um, that's something we haven't really explored yet. But of course, part of this process is that truth, understanding where yeah. you need to grow and improve. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and to be, it's I actually appreciate you bringing up weaknesses because one thing I do in the book is I I kind of acknowledge the fact that I try to ref refrain from that term weakness and talk more about know what you love about yourself, know yeah. what you don't love about yourself, yeah. instead of labeling it as a weakness. Because when you label it as something you don't love about yourself, you can actually be a little bit more accepting of that. You can see yourself more as a human and say, okay, there's this part of myself that I don't I don't love that part of myself. Yeah. What do I want to do with that insight? Do I do I care? Like, again, the joke yeah. I was making before about the fries and the chicken nuggets. Like, yeah, I eat like 95 to 90 percent pretty dang good all the time. And yeah. I have my little things. And yeah. I've been able to come to a mindset now where I give myself grace around that. But there's some people that, that yeah, but yeah. there's some people that don't. There's some people that need to be 100 percent. It's all or nothing, all or nothing. And that's great. That's great. If that's who you are, then, you know that's something that you can learn to love about yourself because maybe yeah. that's something that people have told you don't be all or nothing that's a that's not a good no no, no. Th this is who i am and this is what i love about myself maybe yeah. there's other areas of yourself that you don't love so much and that you can sit with and think okay is that something i'm allowed just to kind of slip and let go yeah. or is yeah. it something i want to do something about how can i learn to love that part of myself that i currently don't you know yeah. and, and i think that's a great place to start especially with weaknesses because sometimes people just get very defensive when you say you have a weakness or I have a weakness. Sure. And, sure. It's, it's, a, it's a label and you almost, you sort of give up. Look, if I, if uh, it meant I couldn't love myself that I could occasionally have French fries, I'm, I'm sunk. That's it. I, <laughs> I love myself. So right. uh, you have a question that I think you like to ask on your career competitor. I do want to make sure that we give people a, a way to know how to um, access your podcast and, and, and get your book and things like that too. But um, ultimate goal on the horizon. What's the next step? Um, Ooh, I, I love that one. The questions that you like to ask. Um, yeah, for you. What's yeah, the ultimate goal right now. Um, I, I am a uh, my my business has a tripod too, so it's not just me that has a, a tripod, but my business does too. And it's it's out of coaching, it's out of workshops, it's out of speaking. And and for me, my ultimate goal is for um as a speaker specifically is to be able to find that balance in the work that i do with my business where i'm positioning myself to be doing as much speaking as i am coaching as i am workshops uh because i love doing everything that we've done in the past hour i love it like for me this is where i get to be truly able to realize what it means to be innovative like it is innovative i guess i said that british innovative um you know this 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 notion of just like when we sit down and we just create this shared space um mm. and we allow our fullest self to come we can sometimes come up with some absolute gold between the between yeah. the two the three of us um mm. and the impact by anybody listening it's just like oh had i not been listening to this I wouldn't have I wouldn't have finished my day having learned this thing today. And so for me, the more I can start to invest in the speaking part of my world, the, the more I know my business as a whole is going to be optimizing itself in terms of the the impact it can have. Nice. Steve, how do people uh, follow you? Get in touch with you. Where can they buy your book? Um, so the book is Amazon. Just go to Amazon, shock the world. It should be the first thing that comes up. Um, I yeah. also, there it is. Uh, it's on, it's on two, two of the three screens now. So Carly, you're the only one that needs to get it. Um, <laughs> joke. But the, 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 the other part too, you go to career competitor, career competitor.com. Um, you'll learn anything and everything you need to about my business there. But for the, for the social media folks at career competitor on Instagram, uh, that's where I do a lot of my just, thought leadership thought processes they come to fruition in little 10 15 20 second reels on there which i really love and seeing the Thanks. engagement around those and you can always yeah. find me on linkedin too so all of all of the things that you would typically be on i'm sure and and you do coaching yeah That's i certainly really do yeah. yeah coaching keeps yeah. me busy and again yeah. I, you know ex executive coaching is is something that i'm incredibly passionate about and the, the way i just label it to every single person is that if you're if you find yourself this is the way I label what I do now is um, if you continue to get in your own way, if you feel as though you're getting in your own way within your process, not necessarily in every single part, but in certain parts, then let's set up a call and let's have a chat. Because for me, the one thing I do as well as anybody is I help you get out of your own way. Nice. I think I saw something about discounts for French fry eating podcast hosts. That's it. Yeah, you, you were right. It, right yeah. in the small print. Right in the small yeah, print. Yeah, very small print. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yep, yeah. yep. We'll thank talk you. about the number later. <laughs> uh, well, Steve, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure.
appreciate the time, Darren Carly. Thank you so much for this uh, for this opportunity to share my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both, Darren, Steve. Yeah, such a pleasure. Um, we have the links in the chat and everyone will send out more information afterwards on, on LinkedIn and via email, So as well as YouTube. So check the notes uh, in the recording as well so we can stay, you can stay connected with Steve. So thank you so much.